and the faithfulness of God for just one more second right here. Yes, God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing. Of the goodness of God. Come on, can we lift up our song to Jesus and sing it out? Sure. 
Let's sing it out. Praise Only you deserve all my praise. God, we thank you so much for your presence in the room. God, and I thank you that we get to be still and know that you are God. And I'm asking that you continue to move through the service as you've already done through worship. And all together, God's people say, amen. Come on, let's put those hands together one more time. Well, Cornerstone fam, we're going into child dedications. We're not just up here singing about the faithfulness and the goodness of God. This is something we pray that goes from generation to generation. Give it up for our kids pastor as he comes out. Awesome. Man, wasn't that an incredible time of praise and worship? Absolutely love. I wish I could sing like them, but I can't. Uh, but hey, this is we're, we're excited about a Sunday like today because today we get to do a child dedications. It's something very important to our church, and many of you might be new to our church or new to faith. And so uh, I want to just take a quick moment to give you a, a very quick synopsis of, of what child dedication is and, and what it is. It's an example that we see in the Bible. We see uh, it happening in uh, 1 Samuel. If you, and you have to read the story yourself. They're, they're, it's, it's a long story. But basically, you've got this uh, lady named Hannah who is praying to God, would you provide me a son? And if you do, I'm going to dedicate him to you. And long story short, God does answer her prayer. She, she has a son. And the son ends up being the prophet Samuel. So you have to read your, uh, read your Bible and read all about him. Pretty major player in history, and, uh, and she, does. she dedicates Samuel to, to God, and, and basically it's a declaration of, of God, this, this child does not belong to me. At the end of the day, this child belongs to, to you, and I, I'm in this child's life for, for really just a moment in time to, to raise this child up uh, in, in the ways of the Lord. And we see it again in the New Testament, in Luke 2, Joseph and Mary brings Jesus to the temple and dedicates Jesus uh, to God. And making that same declaration, God, this child belongs to you. And that's, that's what I love, just following those examples. And that's what these families are doing up here uh, today is following the examples that we see in the Bible. They're making a public declaration uh, saying that this child, at the end of the day, as much as we love this child, does not belong to me. God, this child is a gift from you. And we get the honor and the privilege of raising this child up and, and doing our very best to be the best parent that we can be for this child and, and making you, God, number one in our family's lives. And so I'm so thankful and grateful that they've decided to make that decision. And here's the deal, church, and it's not just them doing it. Uh, we're part of a church family. That, that's what we are. We're a family. And so this is a family thing. And as they're making this commitment as parents and as a family to making Christ uh, the Lord of their, their household, we're making a commitment as a church family to saying, hey, you know, when you're at your lowest, we're going to link arms with you. Because how many parents do we have here today, right? You, you've been a parent. You've, you've been through those times. You're like, I need, a, I need someone to come alongside me. That's what we're committing to do as a church family. Or, or maybe your child has conquered a milestone in their life, and we want someone to cheer us on and to celebrate those moments with us. That's what we're here to do with these amazing families. And so, uh, so we have a charge as well as a church family. But what we're going to do is I'm going to have them introduce who they are. And they've chosen a family verse and a family mission statement. I'm going to read those uh, to you. And then at the end, as a church family, we're going to pray over them and just pray God's blessing on these amazing, amazing families. So here we have, uh, yeah, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, we're the Andre family, and we're dedicating our daughter, Emma Andre, here. Oh, look at this, y'all. Whenever they have these bows, you got a fan club here already. Look at this. you got fans. Those bows just, I'm done already. It's beautiful. Uh, but you guys have a family mission statement. Uh, you said it's to submit to the Holy Spirit and to obey God even in the hard things so that we can be a beacon of hope to others. And your verse was John 13, 7. You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. I love that. We're going to pray that over you guys in just a moment. That's, that's beautiful. And go ahead and introduce yourselves. We're the Peer family. Beautiful. And who are, who are we? This is Noah. Noah, look at, uh, Noah's in the zone, you guys. He's asleep. People are thinking, man, I could do that right now, but I just, I won't do it, but I do, I, I want to pinch his cheeks. They're just so amazing. I, I don't want to freak you guys out. I won't do that. Okay. Uh, but your mission statement 
is, uh, is be dependent on Christ as we share God's eternal love with others, pointing them to Christ who is the only way. And your verse, Psalm 23, 6, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's amazing and we're gonna pray that over you guys in just a moment as well. Look at this amazing, beautiful family. All right, who are you guys and who are we dedicating? Uh, we're the Gesset family and we're dedicating our uh, youngest, Jamie. Awesome, I love it. Hey, Jamie. Yeah, she's thinking, I don't know about this, I don't know about this, but you guys, uh, I love your family mission statement to provide a firm foundation of our faith through commitment to loving God and each other. And your verse, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So that's amazing, beautiful, great verse. Dude, you're looking sharp. Love it, love it. All right, finally, but not least, uh, who are you and who are we dedicating? Uh, we're the Lopez family. Uh, we are dedicating our beautiful daughter, Andalyn May. Oh my goodness, look at that. That outfit just has me done. You guys look sharp, right? You look good? I love it, okay, yeah. He knows it, I love it, good. Um, all right, your family mission statement is uh, to steward our faith and live in unity with believers as we share Christ's love with others. And your verse, Psalm 133, one, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. I love that, right, including the family. So that's, those, those are beautiful, those are great. Hey church, what I'd love for us to do right now is uh, I would love to actually just, just honor and, and have them stand up. If you're family or they would consider you close friends, would you stand up uh, in a sign of support? <clears throat> there you go. Look at, man, there's a lot. I love that, the whole church standing up. That's great. And then maybe there are some of those who uh, are work in children's ministry. So you work in CS Kids because at some point you're gonna have an amazing opportunity to speak into their lives. Would you stand up if you work in kids ministry and just thank you so much for serving these kids. You're gonna see them uh, if you haven't already. And then the rest of the church, would you stand up as well? Uh, would you stand up as well? We're gonna stand up. And if you could do a favor for me, if you feel comfortable, but if you could stretch out your hands toward them, like you're putting your hand on their shoulder or something, it's just a symbol of that. And we're just gonna pray God's blessing and grace upon their lives. God, we thank you. We thank you for these families. We thank you for the decision uh, that they're making to uh, put you first in their lives, in their families' lives. And we thank you for the commitment uh, that, that they're making, that they wanna be the best parents they can be. I love God that you knew they would have these kids in this moment. You knew they were the perfect parents for these children. And so God, I pray that that peace would, would flood these parents right now. God, if there's any anxiety or in, in their lives, I, I just pray that you'd re replace that with peace and boldness as they parent these beautiful children. And God, we pray a uh, blessing on these children. Lord, you're... Bible says that they are a gift. They're a gift to us. And so God, uh, we thank you for this gift. And it's not always gonna be easy, but we thank you that you're gonna be with us through the challenging times and you're gonna be with us in the times of celebration and rejoicing. And so God, we commit right now, God, we give these children to you and, and say, God, they're not ours, they're yours. But God, would your hand be upon them? Would you protect them? Would you keep them safe? Would you give them wisdom? And God, we pray that they would make a decision to follow you at the youngest of ages. And we thank you for what you're doing in these families' lives. In Jesus' name, the whole church says, amen, amen. Thank you so much.
Doesn't that look amazing? That looks so much fun, I can't wait, you guys. Harvest Fest is just around the corner. And I wanna give you just a quick reminder though, and that is if you do attend church typically on Saturday the 26th, uh, we're not gonna be here in the auditorium. And so we're gonna be out in the parking lot doing everything you just saw in that video. We're gonna be eating some uh, good food. Uh, we're gonna be doing some rides, having just a lot of fun. It's going to be an amazing event, an amazing time together. So we do wanna encourage you with this. We wanna encourage you to bring someone with you to this event. Uh, it's not an event just for church people to have fun. It's an event to invite people who typically wouldn't come uh, on a church campus to, to let them come and just experience uh, what it is like to be here and just to have fun. But that event doesn't happen by itself. We actually, it takes an army of people to make that happen. And I heard this past week, we are actually short about 400 volunteers. Every year we end up getting the volunteers, but here's the deal. We need you uh, to be one of those people to say, hey, I wanna step up. I wanna be a part of making that event happen. I wanna be a part of shining the light of Christ with my smile, with my high five, passing out candy, right? We wanna give tons of candy to people so when they leave, those parents have to deal with it afterwards, right? Uh, not really, but kind of. Uh, and speaking of candy as well, we've got a bin in the lobby that we wanna fill full of candy. So what we're asking is that if you have uh, some non-chocolatey candies that you can uh, donate, we would love to fill that to capacity. And that's the candy that we're gonna hand out on that night. Uh, it's gonna be an amazing time. And so would you consider volunteering? If you want information about, Harv uh, about Harvest Fest, just text HARVEST to 21999 and we'll get you all the information you need. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the things I love about our church is that we literally have something for everybody. We really do. I just had lunch with Pastor Lynn this, this past week, and, and I'm fairly new to the church here as well. And one of the things I told him I love is that, is that our church has something for everyone. I mean, no, no matter where you are, whatever phase, stage you are in life, there's a Bible study, there's a small church, there's, there's something for you. And so one of the things I love is that we've got a men's and a women's ministry that's, that's the best. And so we've got experiences just for men, experiences just for women. And maybe you're one of those, you wanna go deep in your faith uh, with, with a brother, you're a guy with, with another guy, or maybe you're a woman and you just wanna go deep in your faith with, with another woman, with, with a sister. We've got those opportunities for you here. So if that's something that uh, you think would, would appeal to you, we would love for you to text men or women to 21999 to get some more information and get plugged into a group uh, that's a men's or a women's group. We're glad you're here. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out to Cornerstone. Thanks so much for uh, worshiping with us this morning. And especially for those who are here for the very first time, we understand you could have gone anywhere, you could have been doing anything. And we say this a lot, but it's, it's only because we mean it. We believe you're here not by accident, but God's got a purpose and a plan for you. And we wanna help you discover what that is. So before you leave, we would love to say hi. If you could stop by the Welcome Center in the lobby, uh, say hello to someone or text new to 21999. We wanna get you some information about uh, who we are, uh, but, but also just, just connect you and, and help you discover uh, your next steps here as well. And finally, Harvest Fest, that video, that you saw, that stuff doesn't happen by itself. It happens because of your generosity. You guys have given behind the mission and the vision to reach people who typically wouldn't come to church. That's why we're able to do that, because of your generosity. This building that we're building to your right is happening because you guys said yes to the next generation and we wanna see God do a work in their life and you got behind the mission and vision to see that happen. And so thank you so much for giving. Thank you so much for being a generous church. And we wanna invite you to give this morning. If you'd like to, as you leave, you can give a, a gift in one of the giving towers in the lobby or you can text to give to 21999. Finally, we've got Pastor Lynn teaching with us in just a moment right after this. Hey, hey, Cornerstone, how you doing? Hey, uh, real quick, before we get started, uh, if you've been around, you know the last few weeks we've been asking you and encouraging you, would you help us uh, partner with our partner in Zambia? Uh, they're in the process of trying to add four new classrooms uh, there on their campus. And what they're doing, they're reaching into the slum of Kibera and pulling out these high-risk children 
bringing them in, making sure they get fed, making sure that they get an education, and more than that, making sure they know who Jesus Christ is. And guys, it's absolutely life-changing uh, for them. And so he said, could we help them uh, with these next four classrooms? And the goal was to raise $100,000 together. And you guys gave $102,000. So man, thank you so much. And I just want to say out loud real quick, because I think you know this already, but when you give, when we ask you to do something like that outside of what's normal, every penny goes there, right? None of it stays here. It all goes where we're telling you that it goes. But thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you that we're changing lives on the other side of the world together on the deal. All right. So uh, week number three in our series about defiance. And really what we've said, the defiance we're talking about is the courage to stand up for what we need to stand up for in a bow down world. And if you've been following Jesus for any length of time at all, you know the world doesn't always appreciate that. They look at you and me and they go, man, you, you really believe that Bible thing? And, and all these kind of moral ideas that you have, you realize how old fashioned that stuff is and nobody does that anymore. And why, why, why would you? And that there is constantly pressure for you and I to live like everybody else who does not have regard for our God. And, and that when we don't, uh, sometimes they're actually frustrated with us because they go, well, you're being judgmental toward us. And for you and I to have the courage that just says, hey, look, look, I, I'm not trying to be a problem. I'm not trying to be a, a jerk. I'm just telling you that I'm gonna stand for Jesus no, no matter what the culture does. No, no matter what everybody else does, I'm going to stand for what God has asked me to stand for. Stand up courage in a bow down world. And we've talked about this idea of honoring defiance. In, in other words, look, I, I'm going to I'm going to do everything I can possibly do. If I've got a supervisor I don't like, I'm going to be the best employee. If I've got a parent that I struggle with, I'm going to be their best child. If I've got a teacher at school and I don't agree with the teacher and I think they're too harsh, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be the best student in the class right up until, right up until you insist that I do something that's inconsistent with my faith in Jesus Christ. And when you do that moment, I'm simply going to say, look, I'm sorry. I can't. I can't. I have a higher authority in my life. And if you make me choose between you and God, I have to choose God. And the reality is, uh, I'm not gonna go burn buildings right now. I'm not gonna go loot stores. I'm not gonna get on Facebook and tell everybody what a horrible person you are. I'm just gonna do what honors my Jesus Christ. And if that means you're gonna unfriend me, if, if that means you're gonna uh, take my job away or kick me out of my class, I, okay, okay. I'm simply gonna do what God has asked me to do, honoring defiance. Uh, today, uh, we're gonna unpack the story of uh, Daniel and the lion's den. If you've been with us, we've been going through the book of Daniel, and the reason we chose the book of Daniel is that Daniel is living in a much darker culture than you and me. He's having to navigate these waters, but these waters are even harsher than what you and I are going through. And yet he does this so well that he literally changes the hearts of kings because of his honoring defiance. And today we get to the story of the lion, Daniel and the lion's den. How many of you grew up in church? Okay, so you get this. I can remember uh, being in Sunday school because this is like one of the favorite stories we tell our children, right? And when they told me the story of Daniel and the lion's den, I got the impression that it was kind of a standalone there was just this moment, and this is what happened to Daniel, and this is what Daniel did. But if you've been here the last few weeks, you go, no, 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 no. There's a history before this. There, there's a whole bunch of things that have happened in Daniel's life, and this seems like just one more big thing added on. So think about this. Daniel has lived his entire life honoring God. He is completely innocent of, of any crime of any disobedience. Now, his culture wasn't. Uh, children of Israel had started worshiping the gods of Babylon. And God it said to them, hey, look, if you like the gods of Babylon so much, I'll just let you be slaves in Babylon. And now Daniel, who worshiped God, did the right thing, has actually been dragged away 
to be a slave also, despite his innocence. Uh, he gets to Babylon, and they begin to say, hey, we're going to put you in the Babylonian uh, speed uh, process of understanding and knowing what it means to be a good Babylonian, which was really just another word for witchcraft. And it's interesting that Daniel has the wherewithal to say, you know what? I'm just going to learn this as best I can. I, I've got a feeling if you'd done that to me, I would have said, you're not teaching me witchcraft. And yet Daniel has enough foresight to say, you know what? I'm going to learn what they think and what they believe even better than they do so that when we have that conversation, I can say, I know you believe this. Let me show you why it's wrong and let me show you why God is true. It's one of the reasons I think you and I as Christians should study evolution. That you and I can go, let me tell you what you believe and let me tell you why it's not true. Hey, let me tell you what, what you believe about these social issues and let me tell you why it's not true and let me show you where the Bible is accurate. Not only is he forced to learn basically uh, witchcraft, uh, they, as best we can tell, they turn Daniel into a eunuch. Uh, they take his future away from him. And if that's not enough, not too long after he gets there, he finds himself in what seems like a no-win situation. They're trying to force him to eat food that comes from the king's table. He can't do that. He's only supposed to be eating kosher. He, he offers a test to them and says, hey, let everybody else eat that. Let me and my friends eat vegetables. And God honors that. And they end up looking healthier than all the rest of the guys. This, this is not a standalone story. Daniel has already gone through all sorts of stuff, and then comes the lion's den, which leaves you and me to go, God, wait a minute. When is enough enough? When are you going to let up on this guy? Why, after all the things that he's done so faithfully, all done so, why are you adding to the heap the lion's den? It's a legitimate question. It's a good question. And let me tell you why. Because I can promise every single one of us in this room, at some point in your life, you will be in the lion's den. And you'll be going, hey God, wait, 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 wait. I've been faithful to you, I've been doing what I, why, why, why would you let this unfairness, why would you let the, why would you heap this on top of everything else it feels like I've been having to carry? Why a lion's den? This is the moment you go to the doctor and the doctor says, it's cancer. And you go, wait a minute, I gave up Doritos. <laughs> I've been eating healthy. How, how, how can this be happening to me? Uh, this is the moment that uh, your job is laying people off. They pick you. And you just want to say, wait, wait, wait. I am a better employee than the people you're keeping. How, how would this happen? And God, why would you let it happen? And now it's been several months since you've had work. The bills are piling up. The mortgage on the house is behind. You're in the lion's den. This is when your child dies. And you go, God, this is, this is just wrong. It's not normal. It's unfair. Children are supposed to outlive their parents. Why the lion's den? This, this is the gal who has fought to keep her marriage. There, there's been an ongoing struggle between her and her husband. She's done everything, everything to hold it together. She has bent over backwards, and he comes in and says, I'm done. I'm leaving. And she says, God, why? 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 After all I've done to be faithful, after all I've done to keep this, why? Why am I in the lion's den? Here's what you need. If, if, if you get nothing else out of the conversation we're having today, get this big idea. The lion's den always has purpose. Let me just say this again. The lion's den always has purpose. Matter of fact, Psalm 38 simply says this. Every sleepless night... When I laid in bed worrying about what was going on, struggling with my problem, God, you knew every single one of those nights. Hey, God, every tear that I cried, you saved in a jar. Which simply means this. 
God knows our struggle. He does not invite us into pain for no reason. The lion's den always has purpose. The big idea, the thing that we need to figure out is, hey, God, why did you invite me to the lion's den? And you and I are going to have the opportunity to watch as it happens to Daniel and ask the questions that you have to ask when they're lowering you in to say, hey, God, what are you doing in a moment like this with me? So grab your Bibles. Go with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 6. If you're not familiar, if you simply go to the middle of your Bible, probably Psalms or Proverbs there, you're going to take a right. Uh, you'll get to uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, Lamentations. I'm sorry, e Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel chapter 6. I just did them all in reverse order. Okay. Whew. Eight years of Bible college to be able to say the Bible backwards. Okay. Uh, Daniel uh, chapter 6. Starting in verse uh, 3 together, uh, here's what it says. Now Daniel uh, so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now, guys, this is a big deal because... We've said, hey, when you have an unfair supervisor, when you find yourself with parents that you don't necessarily agree with, the, the, the most instinctual thing is, hey, I'm going to do the least I can possibly do and not be in trouble. Daniel does the opposite. He literally says, I'm going to be the best slave in Babylon. Think about that. I believe so strongly that God has placed me here. I'm not going to do this because I like the king. I'm not going to do this because I like the supervisor. I'm going to do everything as if God was watching. And I was doing it for him. And because he has, he has so distinguished himself that an ungodly, unbelieving king is ready to make him number two in the kingdom. Now, nobody likes that, right? All the Babylonians are going, you're going to put a Jew, you're going to put a Jewish slave in charge of the kingdom. This is insane, King Darius. Why, why, what right-thinking person would do it? So they decide, you know what, we're going to find some way of accusing Daniel. We're going to find something that we can hold up against him. And so they get together, they have a committee meeting, and they can't find anything. He has been so exceptional, so above the cult in every part of his life, they can't find anything to accuse him in. And they go, guys, this isn't going to work. And someone at the back raises his hand. If you want to get him, get him with his God. Because that's the one thing Daniel will not compromise on. It's the one thing he won't give in on. And so they come up with a plan. Hey, here's what we'll do. We'll go to the king and we'll say, king, look, you're underappreciated. Uh, people don't even realize how great you are. So why don't you come up with a decree? And we're thinking a decree like the Medes and the Persians, which simply just means this decree is irrevocable. You, you cannot avoid it. You cannot amend it. It just stands permanently. And King, if you would make a decree that simply says this, for the next 30 days, no one can pray to any other God and no one can pray to any other person except to pray to you, King Darius. And then people would understand how incredible you are, how wonderful, you, you'd finally get the appreciation that you actually deserve. To which King Darius goes, man, that's really insightful of you. That, I mean, what a great idea. And so he makes the decree. Back to the passage. Verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem and three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had before. How, how simple would it have been Daniel to go, okay, I'm going to try to honor God, but this is a moment to be like a secret agent Christian. And, and so I'm going to close the shutters so nobody can see me pray. And you get that he just lives for God out loud. He lives for God in front of all of his enemies. And even those who are going to get him, he just does what he's always done before. Verse 11, then these men went as a group and they found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and they spoke to him about the royal decree. 
Hey, did you not publish King Darius a decree during the next 30 days? Anyone who prays to any God or human except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the den of lions. The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Now jumping down to verse uh, 15, the king realizes, uh, they say to him, well, you, you, you need to think about Daniel because we just saw Daniel praying to his God. And the king then realizes he's been duped, that these men have actually used him to get to Daniel. And he's frustrated, but it's the law of the Medes and the Persians. He spends the rest of the day saying, is there some way around it? Is there something I can, I had no idea that they were tricking me. And he can't figure anything out. So now the men come back, verse 15. And then the men went as a group to the king Darius, and they said to him, remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order. And they brought Daniel, and they threw him into the lion's den. And you and I are left. Why does God allow dens of lions in our lives? And I want to give you today, and I want to give you three Ds, three things that when you find ourselves saying, God, this feels unfair, this God, God this just feels like another thing, and why, why would you bring this in my life, that you and I would go through these three Ds to try to get clarity, to try to say, hey, God, help me see what you're doing so that I, I, I'm not going to be as frustrated and I can collaborate and cooperate with you on what you're doing. My encouragement is this. If you have a physical Bible today, I would write this in the inside cover of my Bible. Uh, if you don't, uh, there's paper in the seat backs in front. I would write this down because even if you're not in a den of lions today, the day will come and you're going to want these three Ds. Uh, if it isn't you, there's going to be a friend who needs it. and You'll be able to pull it out and say, hey, let's just walk through this together and see if we can discover what God's doing inside the lion's den. I promise you, you want these three Ds. Here we go. Uh, D number one is discipline. I can get myself into the lion's den because it's actually God disciplining me. Because uh, there, there's been an area of my life that I've just been resistant and I've gone, God, I know what you expect and I know what you asked me to do, but the answer is no, no. Uh, you can talk to me about other parts of my life, but that issue, that thing, no. I'm, I'm just gonna willingly and willfully choose to disobey. And guys, I'm just, when you set yourself up against God, when you just go, hey God, you know, uh, no, I'm gonna be a punk about this, right? And I'm not gonna do what you asked me. You understand that you have invited discipline in your life when you and I do that. And, and I know sometimes we think we're getting away with something because we did it and nothing happened right away. Let me just tell you something. If there's a pause between your disobedience and discipline, that is not because God didn't notice, and it's not because God didn't see. That pause is God going to another room to get a bigger belt. <laughs> just saying. Matter of fact, grab your Bibles real quick and go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Keep your finger in Daniel. Go to the back of your Bible. Start working to the left. You're going to come to this book of Hebrews. It's almost at the very end. Hebrews chapter 12, keep your finger in Daniel, we're coming back. Hebrews chapter 12 actually says, you ready for this? It's actually a compliment when God disciplines us. Here we go. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, starting in verse five, he says, have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? This is a good thing that addresses you as a father addresses his sons. It says, my son, do not make light the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because, you ready? The Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son or a daughter. Endure hardship. There's moments that just, man, the discipline of the Lord just feels like hard things. Endure hardship and discipline. God is treating you like his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined, you never get a spanking. And everyone undergoes discipline. Then if you're not, 
then you're not legitimate and not true sons and daughters at all. She says, well, look, guys, I know being disciplined isn't necessarily fun, but you understand the only reason God's disciplining you is because he loves you and he wants the best for you. The truth is it would be terrifying if he never disciplined you because it would probably mean you're not actually a son or a daughter. How many of you in here spank the neighbor kids? One person went, yeah, I do. You're, you're, you're amazing. You're amazing. Not normal, okay? You discipline your own children. And, and Scripture's saying, hey, guys, there's a backwards compliment. If God is, it's because he thinks of you, he loves you like a son or a daughter. So don't despise it. Here's what you need to know. Discipline is not punishment. When God disciplines you and me, he's not doing that to get a pound of flesh. He's not doing that to get even with you. He's not punishing you. The answer is this. When Jesus went to the cross, he took all of your and my punishment. That price has already been paid. When he disciplines us, it's because he's trying to correct us. He's trying to help us live in a better way. So think about this. Uh, you've got a son, and uh, for the past week, every time he wakes up in the morning, he is still tired, he's cranky, he's mean to his sisters, and finally you say to your son, hey, look, that's just not who we are as the Adams family. We don't, we don't behave like this to each other. So I'm asking you to correct your behavior, because if you don't, I will. And your son just keeps going. Every morning he gets up, he's mean to everybody, he's grumpy to everybody. And finally, as a loving parent, you say, guess what? Your bedtime just got reduced by 30 minutes. You're not doing that to ruin your son's life. You're not doing that because you are punishing him. You're doing that because you're correcting him. And you know that his life is better when he treats his sisters with honor and he speaks to his mom with good, right? That's what every good parent does. And what you need to know is that if you're in the lines and you're feeling this thing, and maybe it's correction. Maybe it's discipline because of areas of your life that you're living in disobedience. Here's another thing you need to know about discipline. God very often disciplines us, spanks us, in a different area than our disobedience. Let me say this again because this is kind of confusing. God very often disciplines us in an area that's different than the area of our disobedience. So let's say for a moment, you just said to God, God, I'm not gonna honor you with my finances. And so then you expect, well, God, you're gonna do something bad to my finances because that's the area of my life I disobeyed you in. That is not true. God is gonna discipline you in the area that gets your attention. Every good parent does this. Think about it. Uh, your daughter has a hard time with curfew. Night after night, she comes in later than she promised. She violates curfew. If you were going to discipline her in the area of disobedience, you'd say, hey, uh, you violated time, so we're going to ground you for a week. But what you know about your daughter is that will not make a dent. But if you take away her phone... <laughs> And a good parent says, hey, hand it over. Because I'm going to discipline you in the place that gets your attention. Which simply means when you and I find ourselves in the lion's den, when we find ourselves going, man, life got hard, and I don't understand, and this feels unfair, and God, why would you be doing this? Here's what you pray. God, is there something between you and me? Is there a place I should have said yes, and I've said no? Is there something you asked me to do and I dug my heels in? Is there anything between us? And if God speaks and reveals and says, yeah, I've been asking you this for six months. You, you have been in a wrestling match with me of disobedience. And I did what I had to do to get your attention and to correct your behavior. And here's what you do in response. You go, God, I'm sorry. I repent of my disobedience. And I am promising you from this day forward, I'll obey. You want to know why that's so powerful? Because if the heart of God is simply correction, then the minute you self-correct, 
the lesson can be over and the lion's den can go away. It's the quickest way out of the lion's den. In the story of Daniel, this isn't the case. It's not discipline. God's not saying, hey, Daniel, you've disobeyed me and I need to correct your behavior. So we move on to the second D. The second D is destination. My destination can put me in the lion's den. Let, let me see if I can explain this. There is a place that God is planning to take you. And if you and I are resisting where he's trying to take us, he will do what's ever necessary to get us there. Grab your Bibles again. Go with me to the book of Romans. Still again, keeping your finger in Daniel. Romans chapter eight. And if you're not familiar, go to the back of your Bible, come to the left to the book of Romans. Romans chapter eight. If you've been around church any length of time at all, you have heard this verse a lot of times. The problem is it's been misquoted. And you and I don't get what God actually said in this verse. And if you can let it sink, it will change your life. Here we go. It's Romans chapter eight, starting in verse 28. And here's what it says. And we know that in how many things? All, all things, that crummy teacher, that parent who did not understand, that supervisor who is a jerk, in all things, even the unfairnesses of my life, the struggles of my life, in all things, God works for the good. Here's the problem. Your and my definition of good is different than God's. You know what our definition of good is? I want to be comfortable and I want to be successful. I, I want to have plenty of money and I want to have comfort. That is not God's definition of good. And if you accept that definition, you realize if that's your definition, that's what every person who does not know God defines good as. God, hey, let me be comfortable and let me have lots of resource. You will spend your life fighting God if you chase the same things this world does. So what is God's definition of good? And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for those God foreknew, big Bible word, all it means is this, before you were ever born, God knew you'd be a Christian. And he already had a plan and a purpose for your life, something he was gonna do with you and through you. I know some of you are here and go, look, I'm actually a mistake. My mom and dad took a little too much wine one night, I showed up. <laughs> not true, not true. There is no human being who is not here by the very plan and purpose of God, and he has a purpose for you. The problem is we keep living our own purposes. Those God foreknew, he also predestined. Big Bible word again. All it means is this. God has a destination for you. He has a place he's gonna take you. He's either gonna take you willingly or he's gonna take you kicking and screaming, but he's gonna take you to the destination he has planned for you. And then he tells you what that destination is. For those God foreknew, he predestined, you ready? To be comfortable, to be successful and have a new car every year. That is not the plan. Those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Here's God's destination for you, that when he's done with you, you look like Jesus. That's it. He will do whatever is necessary. He'll bring whatever struggle you need to have in your life. He'll, he'll bring whatever circumstance in your life so that you and I will become more and more and more and more like Jesus and less and less and less like me. It's his goal for your life. It's his plan for your life. Let me see if this helps. I want you to think about you join the Navy SEALs, but you keep the old value. I want to be comfortable. How are you going to do in the Navy SEALs? It's going to be the most miserable experience of your life, right? You're going to hate that instrument. You're going to go, why the heck do you have us out here holding a rubber raft over our head for 10 hours in the freezing water? You're a horrible person. 
Why, why do you have me doing all these sit-ups and you're spraying me with a fire hose? What, what a horrible person you are. You'll hate your instructor. If you and I keep saying to God, God, make me comfortable, give me money, you're going to hate God and you're going to struggle with God. But get to Afghanistan, get in a legitimate firefight, and in that moment, be absolutely calm, know exactly what you need to do in the moment because you've been prepared for the moment, and you're gonna look back at your instructor and go, that is the best guy in my life, because he prepared me for this. God, working in your life is not working for comfort. He's working to make you look like Jesus. I know I've used this illustration before. I, I wish I had a better illustration. I don't, so I'm, I'm just gonna use it again. When we finally get it right, I'll stop using it, okay? All right. <clears throat> I want you to imagine that you're walking down a railroad track, and as you're walking along, you happen to see a chunk of coal that fell off one of the trains. And uh, you pick it up and you look at it and you go, that looks just like Ariana Grande. That's, that's amazing right there. So you decide to keep the chunk of coal. You stick it inside your pocket, you keep walking. A little while later, you're like, did it really look like Ariana? And so you, you pull the chunk of coal out and you go, no, it really, it really does. And, but then you notice the chunk of coal is getting all sorts of dirt on your $70 jeans. And you're like, dude, that's not worth that. It's, it's a chunk of coal. So what do you do with the chunk of coal? You toss it. You get rid of the chunk of coal. Thank you very much for catching that. That was very good. <clears throat> right? Because there is no chunk of coal worth your $70 jeans. We burn coal. You're, working, you're walking down the same railroad tracks, you get just a little further, you see something shiny. You bend over to pick the shiny thing up. It's a diamond. You're going, hey, that's pretty cool. You stick the diamond in your pocket. You walk a little further and you go, was that really a diamond or was it glass? I, and you pull it back out and you go, that's, that's a diamond. You happen to notice the diamond is making your jeans dirty. What do you do with the diamond? You keep it. You're like, this time it's worth a whole bunch of $70 jeans, right? Where do diamonds come from? Coal. Guys, when you came to Jesus, you were a lump of coal. You had a whole bunch of work needed to happen in your life. And guess what God did? From that moment forward, he said, I'm going to start making you like Jesus. I'm going to turn you into an amazing diamond that reflects me. How do you get a lump of coal to be a diamond? Three things. Heat, pressure, time. So guess what God gets to do in your life? To take you from the lump of coal that you are to being like the image of Jesus. He's going to bring lots of heat. Heat is unfairness. Heat is the horrible supervisor. Heat is your kids living in rebellion. Heat is struggling. Heat is the thing that you struggle through. This goes, this is, I wish I didn't have it and it doesn't ride it, but it's preparation for you. It's heat. What's the pressure? The pressure is, is that when you look at the circumstance, you're going to go, I can't fix it. It's bigger than me. I have no human resource to fix that. I need to depend on God if that's ever going to go away. And then there's time. And can I just tell you this? When God is working on you, he will take more time than you're comfortable with. You'll be going, God, I'm done. We can fix this now. And you go, no, we're still working. You ain't quite the diamond yet. Guys, sometimes the circumstance in our life that feels like we're in the lion's den is actually God doing his very best work in you, preparing you, making you look like his son. It's actually your greatest blessing. What do you do in a moment like that? You pray. You say, God, uh, is this discipline? Have I done something wrong? And God goes, no, this isn't discipline. And then you go, well, God, is this me learning something? Is it me becoming more like Jesus? Is, is there somebody I've not been loving to? Is there, is there some place in my life I've said no and been disobedient? Is there, is, is there some place in my life that I've, I've blown off and been in disregard to you? And then when God says, well, yeah. You and I have been having a conversation for six months about what you're going to do with your finances to honor me. 
or, or to love that person at work that you really don't like. And in that moment, when God says that to you, he says, yeah, this is, this is what we're working on. The most powerful thing you can do in that moment is say, okay, God, I'm in. You ask me to love that person, I'm, I'm going to start loving them. I'm going to do the very thing that you're trying to do in me because you ready for this? The quicker I learn it, the less time I've got to spend in the lion's den. Lesson over. Image of Jesus in me. This is not the struggle of Daniel. Dan, God hasn't put Daniel in the lion's den because he has something to learn and something to develop in his life. And so here's the last D. The last reason sometimes God puts us in the lion's den. Display. Display. He says, hey, I'm going to take you. And because you have become so much like Jesus and because of who you are and the character and quality of your life, I'm, I'm going to put you through something that people around you are going to look and go, how are you doing? I, I couldn't do that. That would crush me. That I would curse God if God put me in those circumstances. And you and I are going to live that moment so well that they're going to see God in us. It's literally going to transform them because of how we live that moment on display. Go back to Daniel chapter 6. This is exactly what God does with Daniel. Daniel chapter 6. Jump down to verse 19. Here's what happens. King Darius knows that he's been duped by those guys. He feels really bad that he's had to put Daniel in the lion's den. He's probably been awake all night long. And then it says, verse 19, at the first light of dawn, the king got up and he hurried to the lion's den. When he came near to the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lion's den? And then my guess is Daniel paused before he said anything back because that's what Steven Spielberg would do in the movie. <laughs> and then Daniel answered, may the king live forever, my God. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and their children. And it sounds horribly unfair, but we've had this conversation. When I sin, sometimes my it falls on other people. The people I love the most are the ones who are hurt the most by my behavior. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then the King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language on the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed and his dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and in the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And then King Darius was baptized. No, I'm teasing. But, but doesn't that sound like a believer's confession? That this absolutely ungodly king, seeing Daniel on display says, oh my goodness. You have something, you have a God in your life that is so powerful, so different, so bad. I have nothing to compare him to. What if? What if you're in my moments of struggle? Are God putting me in the lion's den? So that people around me would see me live that moment so incredibly powerfully, so faithfully that they would say, oh, the God you serve must be real. Because I, I could never, I could never navigate what you're doing right now. And guys, think about this. If God were to put you and me on display, wouldn't that be a high compliment? Because isn't God only going to invite his strongest soldiers to the battle? If you were going to play in the Super Bowl, do you start the third string quarterback? Or do you put your best quarterback in the game? And if God were to invite you and say, hey, I'm going to put you on display so the world can see me in you, could there ever be even a higher honor than that? And what if, 
What if the person who needs to see God in you is somebody you love? What if it's your children that need to see God in you? What if it's an aunt or an uncle or a coworker or that crazy, crazy home down the street that you go, they have no hope. And then God puts you on display and they find Jesus. Wouldn't that have been worth the lion's den? Here's what I want us to do. I know that some of us in the room, you go, Lynn, my life's really, really good right now. I'm not facing the lion's den. I love that for you. But I also know that in this room right now, there are some of us that are in the middle of struggle. So I'm just going to ask us to bow our eyes. I'm going to go through the three Ds real quickly with us. And I just want you to say, hey, God, is this what you're doing in my life? So if you're in the midst of struggle, it feels like you and God are in a wrestling match right now. First question is this, hey, God, is this discipline? Is there a part of my life where I've been resisting you and I've been saying no to you? And guys, I'm just telling you, repent. Repent, just go, God, I'm done. I'm done with the argument. I'm done with the fight. I choose to obey. It's the quickest way to end the lion's den. Lesson learned. Is it possible it's about your destination? That God's got you going through some hard times. He's got you in the lion's den because he's teaching you to be more like his son. And he says, I'm, I'm bringing the heat. I, I'm bringing the pressure. I'm going to take my time, but you're going to look like Jesus when I'm done. And would you just in this moment say, hey, God, what, whatever you're teaching me, if you would just tell me what it is. Is it patience? Is it love? Is it obeying you in my fight? What, what is it, God? And then just go, okay, I'm in. I'm in. I want to learn that lesson. I, I'm going to live that part of my life just like Jesus would live it. Finally. What an honor if God has placed you on display. He said, look, I'm, I'm gonna put you into a hard circumstance. It, it's about the people that are gonna see you. So people are gonna see me in you because I put you on display for the world to know that I'm real. I'm gonna pray right now and if you need prayer today, you can come up to the front Hey, dear Heavenly Father, we would have never thought about it, but we're actually saying to you today, thank you for the lion's den. God, if it's about discipline and you, you need us to start behaving in an area of our lives, we get it. It's not about punishment, it's about correction. You're, you're trying to make our life that much better. God, if it's about my destination and becoming more like Jesus, God, that's our heart too. We, we just invite you to do what you, if you have to turn on the heat, if you have to put in the pressure, God will do it. Make us look like your son. God, if it's the incredible privilege of being put on display, that a world would be able to see how real and powerful you are in us. Turn on the lights. Thank you. Thank you for the lion's den. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I love you guys. I'll see you next week. <laughs>